right, good morning everyone. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter number 20. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible, grab one in the pews with you. So I'd like us to read verses 19 through 23. John chapter 20. Will you turn me down just a little bit, please? On the evening of that day, that day is the resurrection day. It's resurrection Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Verse 19 reads, the doors being locked where the disciples were, notice please, for the fear of the Jews. They are behind locked doors. They are fearing for persecution. They are fearing for reprisal. Jesus shows up. Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. When he had said this, when he, Jesus, had said this, he showed them his hands, showed them his side. Then, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Here's their marching orders. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he'd said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Father, come into our assembly on this special Sunday morning that we put all our focus on celebrating the reality of the resurrection. And I pray, oh God, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and that you would be pleased to capture the attention of every person who's been providentially brought here by your divine hand. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that's the evening. That's what happens in the evening. But what about the morning? What about the morning? This morning, we're going to do what you're not supposed to do. We're going to attempt to synchronize these four chapters. Typically, you pick one chapter from one book and you preach it. But I want to be a little bit more ambitious this morning. And I want to do two things. And I want to explain to you what we're doing and hopefully do my best to keep you from getting lost. So on my broken hand right here with my debilitated fingers, put a big S right there. And that S stands for synchronize. And I'm going to try to synchronize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we've called forward four eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to interview them. And collectively, we're going to try to figure out what happened on that Sunday morning from all four different accounts. And then along the way, in my hand, my good hand, put a big E here, we're gonna execute the text. We're gonna preach the text. So we're doing two things at the same time, synchronizing and exegeting the text. A little bit ambitious, but I know you can keep up with me. It'll be hard for you to flip back and forth in your Bibles, so I encourage you just to let me lead you through the slides. We're going to use these four different colors to show us when we're in Matthew, when we're in Mark, when we're in Luke, and when we're in John. Now, how big of a deal are these four resurrection narratives, these four pericopes that I just showed you? 28, 1 through 8, 16, 1 through 8, 24, 1 through 12, and 21 through 18. How big of a deal are these? 
It's impossible, Marcus, to say how big a deal it is. Stretching my hand as high as I could stretch it, getting it on the tallest ladder I could, touching the ceiling would not be high enough, would not be big enough. In fact, it's fair to say that if we don't have these four chapters, we're not even gonna have a New Testament. We would not have a New Testament. These guys are hiding from the Jews. They're not courageous right now. They're not brave right now. They're fearing reprisal. They're fearing persecution. They're ready to throw the towel in and go back to what? Fishing. That's what he found them doing. And everything that they thought was going to happen has failed miserably. Jesus was supposed to overthrow the Romans. Instead, they crucified him. And now all bets are off. And the only reason you can't grasp and I can't grasp the magnitude of this moment, Clint, is because we have 2,000 years of victorious church history that we just jam into that. But if we could get rid of 2,000 years of church history and we could go back to that early Sunday morning, focus now, focus. If we could go back to that very first morning when nobody thinks Jesus is going to rise from the grave. Nobody. None of the women do. The disciples don't. Nobody's thinking Jesus rises from the grave. So these four chapters, 28, 16, 24, and 20, are the biggest, most essential chapters in the entire New Testament. Because they're the narratives that prove everything forward. And so we're going to do our best to get the most out of them this morning. And the way we're going to do it through one, synchronizing, and two, exegeting. Now, you're not supposed to see the fonts. It's not meant for you to read it. I know it's super tiny. But before I could start building slides, I had to create a roadmap for myself. So I could read that small font, and I started color coding all the similarities. What what connections do I see between the three narratives and even the fourth narrative that was written afterwards? Where are they different? And so I'm going to try to lead you through that process. Matthew 28, toward the dawn. Matthew, Mark 16, very early. Luke, at the early dawn. 20, John 20, while it was still dark. And then everyone agrees, first day, first day, first day, and first day. So we see a complete synchronization. We're talking early in the morning, and it is, in fact, Sunday. Now, when it comes to who's visiting the tomb, it's either four or five women. It's either four or five women. The issue is this other Mary right here from Matthew 28, 1. Who is this other Mary? Is this Mary, the mother of James right here, and he neglects Joseph and the two sons of Zebedee? Or is this a different Mary, perhaps even Jesus's um, um, a mother, for example? And I'll show you why we might have four or we might have five in a minute. Notice, please, that Mary Magdalene is referenced in all four Gospels. All four Gospels. Salome is added in Mark, and then Joanna is added in Luke, and only Mary Magdalene is mentioned in John 20. So we have either four or, or, I need to remember how to spell or, four or five women showing up. Now I'm going to show you this map four or five different times. This is Bethany down here. So over in this direction is where the women would have come from. This is the empty tomb way up here in the top of it. And then down here is the house where Peter and John are staying. And it seems like the other disciples are back over here somewhere. So 10 other disciples over here. Actually, that's bad math. It wouldn't be 10. How many would it be, church? It'd be nine. Why would it be nine? Because of Judas. Good job. All right. There's a few of you out there that are paying attention. So the morning starts with Mary Magdalene in the dark purple right here. I'm sorry, in the dotted line. And then the other women being the dark purple. And they're both making their way. All of them are making their way up to the empty tomb. Why are they going there? Why are they going to the empty tomb? They've got to finish what, church? What do they have to finish? The anointing of the body. Remember, they started that on the Friday. Sabbath comes, they've got to cease working, and now it's time to get busy finishing what they started. So they've got the spices, and they're en route to anoint Jesus. The major question they're asking themselves along the way from Mark is, who's going to roll the stone away? 
That's a really big deal. They know there's a giant stone there and they're trying to figure out, we can't do it. We're not gonna be able to do it. How are we gonna get this stone rolled out of the way? Matthew inserts this detail. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So only Mark mentions this great earthquake and only Matthew rather mentions the great earthquake and only Matthew tells us that it was an angel who rolled back the stone and then he's sitting on that stone. Now let's talk about the angels that are involved. Is it two? Is it one? Is it young men? What's going on here? So in Matthew, we have one angel. In Mark, we have one young man. In Luke 24, we have two men. And in John 20, we have two angels. So it's reasonable to conclude that there are two angels. And from Mark and Luke's perspective, they look like what? They look like what? Men. They look like men but not quite like men. They have dazzling apparel. They're dressed in white robes. Their white is like snow. So clearly there's something different about these two individuals. All four gospels make reference to the fact that the stone's been rolled back, rolled back, rolled away, and had taken away. And then this leads us to John 22. So Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And in verse two of Matt, John 20, she leaves. All right. So let's let's kind of get a mental picture in our mind. Five women, four or five women, not sure whether it's four or five. Renee are walking towards the tomb and they get closer and closer to the tomb. And as soon as Mary Magdalene is close enough to see that the stone has been rolled away, she leaves. She leaves the group. She breaks contact. She's got to go to tell Peter and John. So she leaves and she's now departing and she's running towards Peter and John's house. Meanwhile, the other women continue forward. So now we have two parties. Everyone tracking with me. Women en route to the tomb and Mary Magdalene working her way back to Peter and James's house. As soon as she gets there, however long it takes her to get there, she bursts into the house and says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Does that sound like she believes in a resurrection? No, not at all. Not yet. And so here she is. She's on this path right here, running down towards Peter and James's house. <clears throat> Matthew 28, verse four says, and for fear of him, referring to the angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Later, you'll read some of the guards do leave and that's when they bribed the guards. You remember that? They bribed the guards to tell the story. Only Matthew mentions Pilate granted the guard, Jews the guard of the tombs, which is probably why only Matthew mentions the guards trembling. Luke 24, three. But when the women went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Mary Magdalene's left. Salome, Joanna, the other Mary, they go actually into the tomb. When they go into the tomb, they see Jesus is not there. Jesus is missing. While they were perplexed about this, they have no idea, they're not thinking resurrection, where's the body? Behold, or the Net Bible says, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. This had to have been quite the Sunday morning. You've not had one like this. They go into the tomb. They're confused. There's no body. Where have they taken the Lord? They come back out expecting to have the place back to themselves. And now two men are standing there. Where'd you come from? Isn't that a reasonable question? Behold, there they are right there. And these men start engaging them in conversation. They start engaging them in conversation. As they were frightened, of course they're frightened. They're dazzling attire, white as snow. They're startled. Where'd you come from? They bow their heads to the ground. This is where we need to now figure out what did the angels tell them? So what we're gonna do at this point, church, is we're gonna try to synchronize Matthew, Mark, and Luke and come up with the total message that was said. 
28, 5. But the angel said to the women, Mark 16, 5. He, one angel, said to them. Luke 24, 5. The men said to them. So is this really a, an issue, men one or two? Is this an issue? No. He's saying it from the one perspective of one angel talking. He says this is what they collectively said. All right, let's see if we can synchronize this. The first thing out of the mouth is do not be what? Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. What would your reaction be? What? Where is he? All right, where is he? Anybody else? Trembling. Trembling. How do you know that we were seeking Jesus? How do you know why we came here? How do you know? We didn't tell you. We haven't had a conversation ahead of time. How do you know that that's who we were seeking? You seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. He's not here. He's risen. He's not here. He's risen. And then Luke adds that interesting comment right there on the right hand side of the screen. Why do you seek the living among the what? The dead. The dead. Why'd you come here? Why'd you show up at this tomb? Were you expecting Jesus to be here? Were you thinking he was going to be dead? This is a bit of a barb here. Do you see how it's a bit of a barb? Yeah, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? And then we get this detail. Come see the place where he lay. Come see the place. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 7. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you in Galilee. Mark 16, 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Matthew doesn't include that. Luke doesn't include that. Mark does. Thoughts on that? Why include that? Why, why does he get a by name mention? Why does Peter get a by name mention? He doesn't say and tell John and tell James and tell Thomas. Why does Peter get a by name mention? Thoughts on that, church? Sam. He lives in a different house. All right, lives in a different house. Austin. He denied Jesus. What? He denied. Yeah, he denied Jesus once. Three times. Three times. And he's going to be held accountable for that denial. And this is a little bit of a, a, a barb towards why in the world did you deny me? Now, what you need to think about or what we need to think about right now is we're not painting the women or the apostles in a favor, very favorable light right now, are we? Why are we doing that? I mean, this is a made up story, right? I mean, the, the Gospels are legend stories. That's what the modern atheist tells us today. You can't rely upon the New Testament. So if you're going to go back and tell a story afterwards, would you make yourself look bad in the story that you tell? No, you wouldn't do that. Remember, Mark's primary source of information is Peter. Is Peter. And he's not painting Peter in a very favorable outlook right now, is he? This is not a favorable thing right here. I just want to show you that the details in our narrative work to authenticate it. They work to show how valid it is. They work to show how truthful it is. Because if you were telling a story, you would paint it so that you look like the what? The hero. And they don't look like the heroes right now. Nobody believes. They're getting rebuked. It's not looking great for them. Luke includes these additional details. Remember how he told you that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise. So let's put it all together now. I've showed you how it broke up from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I've showed you how it connected. Now let's put it together. This is what the angels said to the women. Number one, do not be afraid. I know, we know that you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. We know you were looking for him. He was crucified. You know why he was crucified. He told you why he needed to be crucified. Don't be afraid. Number two, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's not supposed to be here. He's not in a tomb. He has risen. And then notice these three words. As he 
said. As he said. What did the angels want them doing at that moment? What were the angels expecting the women to start doing at that moment? What did he want them to do? Yeah, he wanted them to believe. Absolutely. And how was the intent to get them to believe? Here's this decisive moment right now where he's saying, as he said, and they're supposed to be racing back in their minds to every single time when Jesus spoke about this. They're supposed to remember these moments in which he spoke. Remember how he told you. Remember, this is not a surprise. Remember, this is not an ambush. Remember, he told you in Matthew 16, in Matthew 17, in Matthew 20. He told you what was going to happen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Hey, it's the third day. You're supposed to be counting days. You just have been marking it on your calendar. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, 23. And they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. Matthew 20, 19. And deliver him over to the Gentiles, that is the Romans, to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. On the third day. So again, this incredible reminder of all that Jesus said. And then come see. Come back in here. Walk back in here with me. Let's take another look. Does he look like he's here? Come see the place where he lay. And then go, go quickly. Tell his disciples, tell Peter that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So Matthew 28 says, so they departed quickly from the tomb with great fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Mark says that they did not tell anyone. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So is that a contradiction? Is that a contradiction, church? How should we put those two details together? (laughs) What? Different Different timelines. They're at the tomb. They've heard this incredible message and they're racing back to the disciples. Along the way, do they say anything? Do they talk to anyone? Do they stop and have a conversation? No. Then they bust into the house where the disciples are. And can you imagine four ladies talking all at the same time? (laughs) Isn't that what's happening? Come on, can y'all not imagine that? I mean, they've got something to say. They're utterly shocked. Joanna, Salome, Mary, they are just racing to tell you what they have just heard, seen. It's incredible. What a time this must have been. What a morning this must have been. So at this point, church, we're done with Matthew. We're done with Mark. And we're down here all the way to verse number 10 of Luke. So this has all been eliminated as well. We've synchronized it. We've looked at it. So the women without Mary are now in route down, like we said, to see the disciples. Luke 24, 10 says, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women. Is this two? Because it's women here, right? So we have one, and then we have two, and then we have three. And then is this four and five? With them who told these things to the apostle. So Luke seems to combine the details with a summary. So in other words, he's giving everybody credit. Mary Magdalene went that way, told Peter and John. The rest of them went this way and told the other nine apostles. Everybody's been covered. This seems to be where John picks it up. 
So she ran, Mary Magdalene ran, and told Simon Peter and the other disciple. Who's the other disciple, church? It's John. And he always writes in what? Third person when it comes to himself. He always calls it the other disciple. So at this moment, Peter went out. He, he's, so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. So again, grab what happened here. Mary Magdalene saw the tomb rolled away. She was coming from this way. Bethany's over there. The tomb's there. She sees it's rolled away, William. Bam, she's moving out. She's got to find Peter and John. She knocks on the door, kicks it in, and she just starts, woo. Can you imagine? The tomb, he's gone, gone. Peter grabs his jeans, he pulls them up. He's on his way, man. And John and Peter are out the door and they're racing where? To the tomb. You guys are looking at me like I'm reading too much into the story. Do you think I'm reading too much into the story right now? No, I don't think so for a moment. They, David, they're devastated. Their savior, their Messiah, their Christ, their king is dead. He's dead. You guys know the story. So you don't, you don't read it like, like, you fast forwarded to the end of the Hallmark movie. You watched the last three minutes of it and then you backed up and watched the whole thing. You're like, no big deal. Peter and John are racing to the tomb. They're racing, okay? And we find out that John was in better shape than Peter. <laughs> Peter had a bit of a belly, and um, John had a, a better morning that day because he gets there first. The text will tell us that in a moment. So Peter and John and Mary Magdalene, no doubt Mary's tagging along. Why is she tagging along? She's already made this journey up here. She's made this journey. She got her steps in. Her Fitbit, it's got a lot more steps on it than Peter that morning, okay? She's had a healthy morning. So now let's finish up with Luke. Luke says that when these women, not including Mary Magdalene, showed up to the apostles, told them what happened, they called it an idle tale. An idle tale. And they did not believe them. Did not believe them. Later, later in Mark 16, you can read, afterward, Jesus appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked them. He rebuked them for the fact that the women telling them about this was not enough. That they determined that what the women had said was an idle tale and they did not believe. I wonder to myself, how many husbands are going to burn in hell because what their women believe is to them an idle tale? How many husbands will say, I think that what my wife believes is an idle tale. I'll let her believe that little story about Jesus. I'll play cater twice a year and go to church on Easter and Christmas. But if that's what she needs as a woman, as a woman to kind of get through life, I'm okay with that. I'm going to go on my own. How many men are out there like that? It's fine that their wife has a walk with Christ. It's, it's fine that she has a little religion. She needs a little Jesus to get her through it. I'll be okay with that. We'll throw a little 20 spot in the offering every now and then to placate my wife. And, and I'll show up on Mother's Day and let's see, Easter and Christmas to placate my wife. I wonder how many are out there like that. I wonder how many men are in churches all over the United States and their wives have the healthy walk with Christ and they think of it as an idle tale because Jesus rebuked them. Amen. He rebuked them for their unbelief. He didn't say to them, I know, it's okay, I understand, it was a little much for you. I'm okay with the fact that you remained in unbelief. It's not what happens. Luke 24, 12 says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what happened. That's Luke's end. That's how Luke wraps up the morning of the events. 
So John picks it up in a substantial way. So let's talk about this. Nearly everyone, nearly everyone believes that, let's go back to my broken hands here. Nearly everyone believes that either Mark or Matthew were the first gospel written. Many say Mark, then Matthew. I think it was Matthew, then Mark, but that's immaterial. Set those two aside. Then Luke says, I'm going to write a more detailed account. And he comes along and writes the third gospel. Everyone tracking? Amen. Sometime later, perhaps even a decade, maybe even two decades later, John's gospel is written. Now, if you're John, the apostle, you're John, and you found out that Matthew or Mark have a gospel, how many would say that you would make it a point to read that gospel? Yeah. Yeah. You're John. And they've written an eyewitness account of what happened, and you were there. <laughs> you actually were there. I would read it from the perspective of, like, you've read the book, and now you go to the movie theater to watch a movie. And you're like, okay, now I've read the book. Let me see how good of a job they did. Have you ever done that before? <laughs> Man, I need some more participation from you guys. All right, how many of you have done that before? You've read a book and you, and you critique the movie. You're like, oh, they missed that, they missed that, not very good. How many do that with The Chosen? How many do that with The Chosen when you watch that? Yeah, and you're like, oh, they missed that. I'm not sure they got that right. So you're John now. You're John, the apostle, and you've read Matthew and Mark. And now Luke comes up with his gospel, so you get that copy also, and now you read it. And suddenly you realize, Nobody's talked about some important details. And your focus now as John is to give us information that's not in Matthew, that's not in Mark, that's not in Luke. And this is an example of what happens. You get one sentence from Luke. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping in, looking in, he saw linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. And John goes, wait a minute. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> in fact, I beat him to the tomb, and you don't even mention my name? Like, uh, uh, hello, I was there. I was part of the two. He, he wasn't by himself. I ran there. In fact, I beat him. It was, it was awesome. He got a little head start, I, and I passed him, kind of spit at him on the way by. <laughs> Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He reached the tomb first. So we're, we're at the end of John here. We've gotten rid of nearly all of Luke and we're at the end here. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and look at John 20, verse 5 and 6. John 20, verse 5 and 6, because we're now ready just to stay in John for the rest of our morning together. We've looked at Matthew, we've looked at Mark, we've looked at John, we've showed you how they've come together. Now we're gonna show you how they're separate. Would you look at verse number five with me, please? And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Church, you're getting incredible details. You're getting details that just aren't made up. I, I, I blew past Peter. I got to the tomb right here. The stone was rolled back. I got to the edge. I could see inside. I saw the linen. Can you imagine what's going through his mind right now? Where is Jesus? From Mary's perspective, they've taken the body. She didn't come back going, he's risen, he's risen. And they said, he's risen indeed. It's not what happened. He looks in and sees linen cloths. His mind is racing. Peter, all out of breath, <laughs> finally catches up and he doesn't stop. He goes right in the tomb. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. Saw the linen cloths lying there. And then here's the detail that John includes. He's read Matthew. He's read Mark. He's read Luke. And he says, nobody talked about the napkin. Nobody mentioned the folded. How did you miss that, Matthew? How did you miss that? You're the movie critique. Come on, you've done that before. You remember a really great detail from a book 
And you're like, are you kidding me? You guys couldn't figure out how to get that into the movie? That was a, this folded linen cloth is important. Yes, yes. Who folds a linen cloth when you're getting out of, like, I'm not going back to that bed. I remember sometime during my years of being a son-in-law with the best father-in-law in the world until, until he went to be with Jesus. And it was, I mean, I just had it. Claude Gilbert, best father-in-law in the world. And um, I remember somewhere along there, I said, Dad, you're not making the bed anymore? And he said, son, what's the point? I'm going right back in it tonight. <laughs> All right. So let's just do a quick survey. How many of you make the bed? And how many of you is like, I'm going right back in it. What? All right, let's go. I, I'm a bed maker. We make the bed every day, no matter what, even though we're going right back in. Okay, well, you, bed, okay. How about girls? I didn't, like, are you not participating? Because I'm working right over. Mom and dad both said they I assume they sleep in the same bed. Do they sleep in the same bed? No, they don't sleep in the same bed? Oh, my goodness. Okay. What? They're throwing you under the bus. Yeah. Why would you fold a linen napkin? Why, why would you do that? It's important detail, don't you think? Fold it there. Let's look at the next verse. Look at verse eight. Look at verse eight. Verse eight is incredible. Get your pen out, get your pencil out. Get what you write in your Bible out with. Then the other disciple, that's John, who reads the tomb first. You've already said that once already. I mean, I don't know. Kind of remind us. Also went in. And then I want you to notice what the scripture says. And he saw. With his eyes, he saw. He saw the folded napkin. He's already seen the linen cloths. He couldn't see the folded napkin from outside. He saw the linen cloths. Now he's seen the folded napkin. If you steal a body, you don't take the time to fold a napkin. If you go in there to steal a body, you don't pause for a minute and say, don't you think we ought to fold the napkin? It's a detail that's incredible. And John, the author, wants you to know when he believed. This is John's testimony. This is John telling you, I became a believer at this day. You say, are you saying that he wasn't a believer before? And no, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the belief changed. What do you mean it changed? I believe that you're the Christ. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you're the one that's going to sit on a throne. And I want a spot on that throne. We want the right and left hand side. When you conquer the Romans and establish the Davidic kingdom all over again. That's what he believed up to this point. But then his Messiah died. Are y'all tracking with me? His Messiah died. He's dead. And all hope... All political hope in overthrowing the Roman um, Empire and reestablishing Israel, make Israel great again. <laughs> yeah, that's a little barb for you, all you guys that wear those silly hats. Okay? Okay? Because we're counting on Christ to make it great again. Amen. And they're, they're devastated. Sam, you know it. They're going back fishing. They're going back to the livelihood of, all right, I guess I'm going back to selling life insurance. It was miserable, but I'll do it. Not John. John's letting you know that when he entered into that tomb and saw that folded napkin, it was a game changer for him. I saw and believed. When did you believe? Don't give me this always stuff. Don't give me this always stuff. I've always believed. He believed when he saw. 
You're not surprised by this use of John's word believed. You know that this is John's theme from the beginning of the gospel to the end of the gospel. You know this is his gospel. You know this is what he writes about. This is what he talks about. This is his purpose statement. Look at verse number 30 with me. Look at verse number 30 and 31 with me in the end of John. You should already have it underlined in your Bible. If you don't have it underlined, now's the time to underline it. This is the purpose of why John wrote the fourth gospel. Matthew's already written. Mark's already written. Luke's already written. And now there's an introduction to a fourth gospel. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things, these things that I wrote, every detail, everything that I included in this book was written to move you, Mr. Unbeliever. You move you, Miss Unbeliever, from a state of unbelief to a state of belief. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In his name. Would, would you all just pause with me for just a moment? Would, would you allow yourself, forget about what time it is, forget about the rest of the day for just a moment. And would you just imagine following Jesus for three years, three years, three years of being a Christ follower, fully convinced that he is the son of God and he is the Messiah in every regard. And he's dead. Dead. He's dead, Jerry, dead. You saw him, you took him down, you put him in a tomb, they rolled the stone. Church, you went to the burial service. You saw the casting closed. You saw it dropped in the ground. You saw the bulldozer take the dirt and fill it over. It's done. You go home destitute. We don't grasp this. Let's be honest, we don't think about this. How miserable was Friday night? How miserable a day was Saturday? They didn't go out and play Frisbee and have a great afternoon. Peter's not getting out of bed. John's not getting out of bed on the first day of the week. Nobody's running to find the resurrected Lord. They are all fully convinced he's what? Dead. And John is helping you understand that going in the tomb, seeing the folded napkin was the turning point for him. What's your turning point? What's your turning point? When was your turning point? When was your turning point? Sister, when was your turning point? Clint, when was your turning point? Have you had a turning point? Have you, you, I know Dennis, by your testimony, you've had a turning point. Sister, I know you've had a, when was your turning point? When did you come to believe? Stop this always stuff. Stop this always stuff. I grew up a Christian home. Of course I'm a Christian. Not true. Everyone needs a decisive moment, a turning point, an aha moment. Let me wrap it up for the next five minutes. Church, there is a tension in the word of God. There is a tension that pulls at each other like these two men in this picture doing tug of rope rope pull. And depending on your denomination and depending upon the creeds and the confessions and how you describe yourself, I'm reformed, I'm not reformed. You have a tendency to park on this side or you have a tendency to park on this side. I could start naming denominations. I could start naming leaders. I'd put them on this side. I'd put them on this side. We'd go back and forth. For example, if we go back, this is the Jonathan Edwards side, and this is the John Wesley side. 
as a point of comparison. The reality is, church, if you're preaching the whole counsel of God's word, one minute you're talking about the sovereignty of God and the salvation of the man, and the next minute you're talking about the human responsibility to do what only you can do, which is believe. And any time we get way over on this side or we get away on this side, we're not holding in balance what scripture expects us to hold in balance. Notice John didn't say, now I knew I was elect. Now I knew I was chosen before the foundation of the world. Now I know that my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now I knew that I was born again. That's not what he said. What did he say? He believed. He believed. And this is what it takes. This is what it takes. We don't need an invitation. I don't need to get the pianist up here playing just as I am without one plea. And then I beg you to come forward and I lead you in a sinner's prayer. I don't need to do that. Why? Because you can believe where? Right where you're at. What must you believe? You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for your sins, that he was buried and rose again on the third day. Is there anything else? Do I have to pray a prayer? No, you don't have to pray a prayer. What if I prayed a prayer? Understand that your prayer didn't save you. It was faith in Christ that saved you. Understand that. Get it now. Nail it down. But I was led in a prayer at the school I go to. Fine, you were led in the prayer. I now understand that it was your faith in Christ that saved you, not the prayer you prayed. Now let's make sure that we nail this down with one or two more slides to get it and then we'll be dismissed. And I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. In the same way, here's a theology lesson for you this morning. We're entering seminary. In the same way that there are no square circles, and there are none, there are no born-again unbelievers. There are no born-again unbelievers. What what are you talking about? Uh, uh, Church, born-again is God's work. Do y'all get that? Born-again is God's work. Born again. You can't make yourself born again. What did Nicodemus say? How can I enter my womb a second time? Then what's my responsibility? To be a believer. So what can we conclude? Let's wrap it up. What can we conclude? When John believed, was he regenerated? Was he born again? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Two weeks ago, we talked about this. We talked about we were dead spiritually. Do we remember this? Talking about how dead we are spiritually. Dead people don't what? They don't believe. They don't believe. So to believe, you must be what? Born again, made alive, regenerated, new creature in Christ. This is the work of the Lord on the human being. Then what do I have to do to be saved? Believe, believe, believe. What if I'm not born again? If you believe, you're born again. If you believe, you're born again. Well, how do, I, how do I know? Believe. What about tomorrow? Believe. Next week? Believe. Next month? Believe. Yeah. Don't go back to a date and time. Don't go, don't go back to a date and time. Where do we live? Now. Now. So the question is always, what do you now believe? What do you presently believe? Let's pray. Father in heaven, if there's an unbeliever here this morning, if there's more than one, if there's a room full of unbelievers, if there's a lady, a man, if there's a young person, God, call them to yourself. Open their eyes to the glorious gospel. Do in them what only you can do, Father God. Holy Spirit, prevail upon them. Give them, oh God, the faith that it takes to believe the gospel message. If there's a young person here, I pray that you would profess your faith in Christ today. Tell your mom and dad, tell a friend. Let the world know. Today, my eyes were opened. I saw the folded napkin. 
I saw the reality that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. And, and today I became a believer. Make that profession of faith. Confess that Jesus is Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved according to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.